Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, and I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute. It makes me very happy to welcome you all back to our Hubble Hangouts here because you guys have been filling, giving us all kinds of great feedback, and just it's just been amazing. To we were just talking before the hangout. This is we've been doing this for two years now. So every week we try to bring you new science from the Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, we are here today with yet another uh, example of that. This week, astronomers using both the Spitzer Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope have uh, have uh, been looking at galaxy clusters, and they have found something interesting in there that sh that ordinarily they do not find. I'm not going to give it away yet because the, uh, the we're going to have the astronomers tell you all about it. So. Now, this is ordinarily the time when I start giving out uh, announcements and stuff, but I don't have any, so because I don't think anything <laughs> yeah, all that interesting was going on, so I'm not going to pass it on to you guys, but I would like to uh, invite you guys to uh, leave questions and comments throughout the, uh, throughout the Hangout, and we will read them throughout, and I'm going to have Scott tell you about that in just a minute, but first I have to introduce my, my partners in crime, Dr. Carol Christian, who joins Hello. me. She's the HST Project Outreach Scientist. Hi, Carol. Also, hello, joining, hello. also joining me is do, uh, I almost said Doctor, Doctor Scott Lewis. No, <laughs> Scott no. Lewis. Scott Lewis from uh, the uh, from knowthecosmos.com and a great many other places around the internet. He's driving the drive the internet for us during these hangouts. And why don't you tell everybody, Scott, how they can interact with us? Yeah, absolutely. So the best and easiest way for you to interact with us is using the Q&A app. So while we're live right now, you'll see on the bottom left of your screen some yellow text saying that we are answering questions. I've got it loaded up. Tony's got it loaded up. If you have any questions for us and our guests or even some comments about that, you can ask that in there. And you can even um, plus one, you can bump them up. So if there's a question out there that that you like and you want to have answered, you can go ahead and recommend that. And we can select it when it's live and it'll let people know that we are answering that question that's going on. Uh, you can also comment on YouTube and also on Google+. We have a Facebook event for this as well. And the other great way for interacting with us is over on Twitter. So as you see in my lower third here, we have the Hubble Hangout hashtag. So I've got Twitter up right now over in TweetDeck and we'll be answering questions and I'll be live tweeting as we're going on. So just uh, either at mention Hubble Telescope or use the uh, hashtag Hubble Hangout and we will get your questions and reply to them during the show. And we'd also I want to remind you guys that, uh, you know, it happens about, it's starting to happen more often now. People are telling me that they can't find the Hangout. And the best way to find it is to subscribe to us on Hubble Site Channel on YouTube. Uh, and that will alert you when the ones are coming out live. But you guys should know by now, every Thursday at 3 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, we are here doing Hubble Hangouts. And so you should always check out the channel there. You could also follow us, like Scott said, on at Hubble Telescope. So those are the two easiest ways to find out about these Hangouts. And you know you want to find them because they're becoming world famous. I was looking at the uh, demographics the other day. Hubble huggers, Hubblers. Hubbleholics, whatever you want to call yourselves, <laughs> all of you guys are all over the world watching these Hangouts, and I think I know why. We were talking about this also before the Hangout. You know why? Because where else in the entire internet are you going to learn what the mass of a blue giant star is in units of cows? Cows. <laughs> That's right. Or, or the energy of a quasar, of the, of the energy of a quasar in units of ant push-ups. Well, these are the kinds of things, folks, we've made astronomers do in the past. And where it's highly scientific. Entire internet, are you going to find something like that going on? And now on? our guests have just left. Because I, that's, <laughs> that's right. We they make don't want to them. do those calculations. <laughs> We make you guys earn your degrees, right? It's like, <laughs> I mean, I, yes, it's great that everybody I, and, has. And just, I just want to comment. I don't know why people can't find Hubble Hangouts. It's called Google. I know people type Hubble Hangout, and, and there can, are like five links: to YouTube, to our website, to all things. So. Yeah, I agree, but the still, say. nevertheless, people say they search for it, can't find it, so I'm trying to help them in any I'm way I saying, can. It's but not you know, rocket science. 
Yeah, you know what I'm going to do in the next in the next uh, exoplanet hangout. I'm going to ask the guests to tell me how many chewed up pieces of gum would that would fit in a Neptune sized exoplanet. That's what I want to know next. So stay tuned, folks. We'll find all that out well, this that, week. Yeah, that might be next week. If I can drum up some exoplanet people. <laughs> <laughs> so this week we have a very interesting hangout in store for you, and if I haven't scared away my guests, although I feel like I have almost uh, scared away one of them already, um, don't worry, we're not going to make you do any weird calculations this week unless... Uh, I will. I'll make you do them. Oh, okay. Scott, okay. I was going to be nice, but, you know, Scott's... I'm never nice. nice. <laughs> so as, as I mentioned at the top of the uh, hangout, astronomers using both the Spitzer Space Telescope and Hubble and, I guess, the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope, which is on the ground, uh, in Hawaii, uh, were looking at this galaxy cluster, and they found something. They looked at some. They they found things that surprised them. And I'm going to let you. I'm going to let them describe what that is. But before I do, I've got to introduce them. With me is Dr. Tracy Webb. She is from McGill University, astronomer in Montreal. Hi, Tra Tracy, and welcome. Thank you also, very much. Also joining me is Dr. Allison Noble. She is from the University of Toronto, and Adam Muzzin from Cambridge. Welcome to both of you guys. It's good to have you on our hangout. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. And by the way, we really appreciate them being here visiting us from Italy. Oh, they're really? Italy. Italy. Yeah. Yeah. They're at a conference in Italy. Oh, you're in, oh, you're in Italy right now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, we want to clear a very busy schedule. <laughs> yeah, we could be having a glass of wine. <laughs> uh, you don't know how I, to I be know. Fair, we didn't stop you from having a glass of wine. That's right. In no. fact, we're gonna, in fact, we're gonna probably come up with a word for a drinking game soon. So you might want to, uh, you might want to stay tuned. It would not be a first time we've had a drinking game, but uh, <laughs> drinking espresso shots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is the last thing any of us need right now. <laughs> okay, so uh, th today we put out on uh, on Hubble side and as well as went out into the internets in general a press release uh, that was announcing some of these findings, some of these observations. So Tracy, I think I'd like to start with you, but I also want to, we always wait too long to put up images. So Scott, if you'd go ahead and put up this image. This is a galaxy cluster. And Tracy, can you describe a little bit what we're looking at here? Yeah, so what you're seeing is, I guess, um, a side-by-side -side image. Um, the Obviously, but I'll just make it clear, the, the image on the right-hand side is a zoom-in of the image on the left-hand side. And the image on the left-hand side is a close-up of this galaxy cluster um, that myself and my collaborators discovered. Um, you can see a lot of the, well, we can explain what a galaxy cluster is in a minute, but um, it's essentially a conglomeration of many, many galaxies held together uh, in in space by their own pull of mutual gravity. And okay. you can see we can see a lot of the clusters there. Um, the cluster members, sorry, shown as kind of red galaxies. Um, now, but the thing that we we're really surprised to see is that funny J-shaped object that seems to run in between two of those kind of red galaxies, which is highlighted on the right-hand side. Okay, um, I want to. Oh, let's get to that in just yeah. a minute. But let's go back to what. Let's just get, let's take a step back. And you were already on the right track by describing what these galaxy clusters are. What is the name of this thing? It has a name that I'm afraid to say. It is called Sparks 1049 plus 56. Ah, uh, okay. And it's called that for what reason? It's called that uh, because it was discovered as part of a search or a survey for galaxy clusters, which is called Sparks. And Adam can tell you a lot about Sparks because that's his baby. Um, Sparks stands for the Spitzer Adaptation of the Red Sequence Cluster Survey. Oh, I love I love acronyms like that. Yes, okay. so it's an acronym within the name. <laughs> <laughs> it just and all the way down. Re, re, that's right, acronyms all the way down. Yeah. Recursive acronyms. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the Sparks is the name of the survey that it was found within, and then 1049 plus 56 is just a short handle for its um, uh, coordinates, celestial coordinates in the sky. Do you guys say it that way when you're in like meetings and stuff? Do you go, you know, that I was looking at Sparks 1049 plus 56, and uh, I well, saw. So for the longest time, they were just calling it Tracy's Cluster, which I really liked. Oh, that's really <laughs> good, Tracy's Cluster. Yeah, yeah that would work. <laughs> <laughs> but we I'll, I'll we do some usually, graphic design after the show, and I'll make sure you have your call it okay. Cluster. In short form, we call it 1049. 
Okay. Well, Tracy's Cluster, we're going to call it Tracy's Cluster on this Hangout now. So Tracy's Cluster, it has, according to the press release, has 27 galaxies in it, and it's pretty massive. How many, how many uh, suns would that be? Well, so first of all, it, we've only confirmed 27. Um, oh, there may be more then. There's probably lots more because it's, it takes a long time on a telescope even just to get one member confirmed. So we've confirmed 27, but there's probably lots more. I'm sure, you know, many hundreds. Um, but in terms of the overall mass of the cluster, we estimate it to be um, a few, so in, in scientific speak, a few times 10 to the 14 solar masses. Important so, probably 10 to the 14. <laughs> <laughs> so 10 to the 9 is a billion, and this is 10 to the 14 suns. Okay. But that includes, you know, all of the galaxies, all of the gas, and all of the dark matter. So we are into the trillions, and it is, yeah. and these things are pretty far away then, right? That's right. Roughly according, about 10 billion light years. And for those of you who want to see it in the sky, you have to look in the constellation of Ursa Major. That's right. So that's sort of what we're talking about. Um, so, uh, Adam, let me ask you about the SPARC. What is the SPARC survey then? Was that something that is looking at the, the, the word survey tends to imply an entire looking at big areas of the sky, is that what it's doing? Yeah, actually, so Sparks used um, a combination of data from the Spitzer Telescope and the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope, and basically the way that um, what we did is we, we took pictures of the sky over a fairly large area from both of those telescopes, and the idea is that if you want to find very distant galaxy clusters, uh, the galaxies that you find in them tend to be very red, and so you look for things that are sort of very red when you take pictures between Canada, France, and Spitzer, and if you can find those, and they're also bright and in big clumps, those tend to be galaxy clusters that are very, very far away. So the point of Sparks was to find these kind of things, very distant galaxy clusters, you know, amongst the most distant that we can possibly find. Okay, and I want to, um, Tracy, I want to come back to you in a minute about this, uh, getting these things confirmed, members of the galaxy, but before I do, let's, Carol, let me get you on, I'd like to get you to talk, you said before we started, you know a lot about the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope and Spitzer, so why don't you tell us a little bit about these instruments, what, okay, are, they, what so, are they like? So, the Spitzer is a space telescope, which is one of the great observatories, like Hubble, Chandra is the X-ray great observatory, Spitzer is roughly the infrared, Hubble is the UV optical, although it has a little infrared, and then there was a gamma ray observatory, and those were called the great observatories. Um, and the three, Chandra, Spitzer, and Hubble, are still in orbit, and they are often used in concert uh, to do multi-wavelength studies because, you know, an object might have x-rays, might be visible in the infrared, want to compare to Hubble. Um, and Spitzer is something like 33, 34-inch diameter telescope. It has a number of instruments on it and mostly looks in the infrared. So it, it's really good for looking at some of our favorite things, distant galaxies, um, exoplanets, and uh, also the center of our galaxy or in other parts of our galaxy because the infrared looks through the dust. Um, Infrared also, as Adam was just saying, can help find things that are very far away because of the reddening and um, the expansion of the universe. Canada, France is actually a ground-based telescope. It was built by Canada, France, and uh, the University of Hawaii. It's on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. I worked there for nine years. Um, and it's actually a magnificent telescope, and it has uh, lots of capability. It has imaging capability because the site is really good. Not as good as, as orbiting uh, satellite telescopes, but in, the, in its day, it did some pretty darn good imaging, and it's still really good imaging, and it also does spectroscopy. And so it's always helpful to have ground-based telescopes because you can get, they're, they're useful because you can change instruments more quickly, and if you build new ones, you can put them on a ground-based telescope more quickly than you can putting one. And we're not servicing Hubble anymore, and we never service Spitzer, and we never um, service Chandra. So Canada, France has a, has a really good suite of instruments for this kind of work. 
Yeah, a lot of people don't know this, but while infrared astronomy is best done in space, there are some places on the planet where are, that are very good for doing infrared astronomy. The requirement being you need it to be very dry. You need to have very little water vapor in the atmosphere so that the infrared can get through. And in Hawaii happens to be one of those places, even though you think of Hawaii as a humid tropical environment, at 14,000 feet, it's pretty dry up there. And uh, the same is true for the high, high in the mountains of Chile, which, are, which you see a lot of uh, ground-based telescopes. Exactly. And back in the day, we used to go up to the telescope and do the observations. And I'll tell you, there's nothing better than coming out of that, um, you know, four days of dusty environment going straight to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Get the bends going the other way. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's amazing. So, uh, uh, but what do they do now? You said back in the day they did that. What do they, they do? They still go up to the no, largely or? the observations. I'm not sure what um, Tracy and collaborators did, but uh, our friend Gordon Squires was just out there two weeks ago observing, and they observed from God's country, Kamawela, Hawaii, or Waimea. Mm. Um, uh, uh, you know, from either CFH, CAC, there's a bunch of observatories, and they they um, they often observe from a more habitable um, place where you can actually get food and like water stuff like that. So uh, they don't get you know altitude sickness going up. I was just there a little while ago too, and the, the observatories for Keck out there are it's like out in no man's land, but it's still great because you still have access to everything as opposed to being in no man's hey, land. Hey, there's a Starbucks really across the street from Keck. <laughs> so. Well, I need to go back then because <laughs> that would that would be awesome. Wow, you'll get that. I need my soy latte now. <laughs> exactly. For example. All right, we digress. Don't get that in space, Spitzer. Okay. <laughs> So, all right. So, uh, Tracy, I want to go back to something you were t you had said about these galaxy clusters and getting members of them confirmed. You said that was kind of a big deal, uh, but that you know there were only 27 so far. But you think there's hundreds. I don't understand what. I mean, uh, uh, Adam was just telling us about the survey itself. They presumably identify these clusters pretty quickly. There's a big old chunk of them there, and then, but then you said that getting the individual galaxies confirmed is kind of a big deal. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that what that's involved, what's involved in that. Right, so if we want to know what, what Adam finds is essentially the location of one of these um, galaxy clusters. He sees like a big over density of galaxies um, in his survey, but we don't know right away which individual galaxies in that over density are actually part of the of the cluster, because if you think about it, what you're seeing when you look at the cluster is everything that's in front of the cluster and everything that's behind the cluster and everything that's in the cluster all projected onto one sort of two-dimensional image. And so just by looking at it, we can't necessarily, we know that most of the galaxies that we see in that image are probably cluster members, but we know that there's also some contamination. So the way we actually, um, the way we confirm that a galaxy is within the cluster is by measuring the distance um, or the redshift to that particular galaxy. And so we do that by gathering, uh, obtaining spectra for the galaxy. So we need a, a really, really powerful telescope that can provide really detailed um, measurements of the emission or the absorption lines in the galaxy spectrum. And for that, we actually used another ground-based telescope, which is the, the Keck Observatory. And so we have to go out and measure an individual distance to every single galaxy in that image that you see there and see which ones are at the distance of the cluster and which ones are either in the foreground or in the background and basically separate it out into like a three-dimensional image. And so each one of those observations takes a long time. I see. So that's what you meant. Okay. So with Redshift, we've talked about that at least 153 times on these Hangouts. So they're, 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 it's a number. It's just a, a way in which we find out how far away these galaxies are. The bigger the number, the far, farther away they are. The galaxy record of uh, Hubble has been somewhere of about Z equals 11, something like that, which is pretty darn far away. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Frontier Fields is hoping to make that even break that record too. So anyway, that's just a number of how far away things are, and it's a time-consuming measurement. Now, you yeah. guys said you used uh, Keck to get that done, um, uh, but um, uh, 
so Alice, or yeah, Allison, let me let me uh, try to get you into this conversation a little bit. I haven't heard from you yet. Why don't you describe for us a little bit about what your role is, what your interest is in this, and some of the things that uh, that you that you've noticed about the about this galaxy cluster. Sorry, you broke out for a second. I broke did? Out for a second. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was I, I wanted to, I wanted to try and get you involved in the. I wanted to, I wanted to get a sense of what you were doing uh, as part of this team. What what your interest right. is, and uh, what about this galaxy cluster uh, got you got you going? Right. So we've only just started to talk about um, some of the wavelengths we've looked at this cluster, but we've also um, looked at it at the far infrared, infrared all the way through far infrared and submillimeter wavelengths as well. And that's kind of where my role comes in, is looking at some of these longer wavelength um, emission from the, the cluster and the galaxies in the cluster. Um, so we, so we, we talked about Spitzer, um, that we have MIPS 24 micron imaging, but we also have um, another space-based um, telescope that we're using, which is Herschel. Oh, um, yes. which is no longer ESA's. that's an ESAScope or was yes <laughs> was yes so it's no longer running but um, they we there's a bunch of archival data um, from Herschel that you can download yourself and reduce the images so we we use that um, the archival data to get three additional wavelength measurements of um, one of the the galaxies in this this cluster that I'm sure Trace is going to talk about a bit more. Um, so it's the brightest cluster galaxy, which is kind of the, the main focus of this paper. Um, and then additionally, we also got uh, imaging from a submillimeter telescope, also on Mauna Kea, um, called the JCMT. And you guys hogged up everybody's time, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These people live right, right? They go to yeah. conferences in, in Italy, and they observe them <laughs> I was like, really? We need to the Galaxy cool. Cluster game. You still go up the mountain for JCMT, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Um, you don't have a Starbucks, but you, you do get to see the, the Mars-like landscape on the top of Mauna Kea and spend 14-hour nights observing on JCMT. There it is. Scott's got a picture of it there. So. Yeah, staring at us from the top of not at us, but at the sky at uh, from uh, the top of Mauna Kea. So um, okay, well, so you looked, at, Scott. Would you please put back up the uh, the the cluster image again? Uh, so Hubble had something to do with this. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, you looked at it with Spitzer as part of this survey. Went and used the uh, CFHT to kind of go back and verify things. And so, Tracy, go ahead. You said the thing that interested you the most was this little squishy thing in between these uh, bright blobs there. I know this is extremely dense jargon I'm using here, but <laughs> so, but, but this squishy thing, this squishy <laughs> thing is what you what intrigued you. What is is that a galaxy being lensed? What is that? Well, okay. So let me back up. So that is is seen only in the Hubble image. So that was uh, when we, we actually knew that we had something really exciting before that from the Spitzer imaging that Allison was talking about, which gives us, uh, it gives us measurements in the mid-infrared, so at 24 microns. And that's a wavelength that comes from dust that's heated by very young stars. And it's a really good, if you want to know if there's star formation going on in a galaxy, a really good way of determining that is to look at it at these 24 micron wavelengths. Because if there is star formation going on, the whole thing will just glow. Because it's hot. There's a lot of hot because stuff it's hot. going on. There. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, it, and the star formation generally occurs behind these, I like to think of them as big cocoons. Um, and the the cocoons of dust and the dust absorbs the light from the baby stars and then radiates it away in the infrared just like you and I radiate in the infrared and so we... Some more, some more than others. Some uh, more than others. Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, okay, so uh, Spitzer looked at this first, you saw a lot of heat going on there and that caught your attention. Right. And that caught our attention and so then we wrote a proposal to the Hubble Space Telescope which essentially wanted to see what was going on. We wanted to know why there was so much star formation happening. And when we took the image with the Hubble Space Telescope, this is the image that we saw. We saw, I don't remember what you called it now, but the, the long blobby thing. 
I would um, call it squishy, squishy, but you know, thing. you're the you're the astronomer, so if, if it's blobby, then we'll it's defer. both. It's so if you look <laughs> at it at it carefully, you have to kind of squint your eyes a little bit. But it is a long tail which seems to be coming out of one of the very bright galaxies that you see there, and there's sort of clumps all the way along that tail, and then it finishes off in this kind of backwards J structure, which also has lumps in it. So there's both diffuse emission, and the whole thing is very long, and then along its length there's all, the, all of these clumps. And we could only see that with the extremely high resolution of the Spitzer Space Telescope. It was completely invisible in all of the other imaging that we had. And so this was really exciting because this is, the, this is a sign that something very violent has been happening with this object. It, something in this object has essentially been ripped apart and it's been pulled apart along what we call this tidal tail and there's new stars which are probably being formed all along it um, because of this very violent process. So which blob, which red blob are you thinking this is a part of? The one in the, the upper right or the, the lower right? The one in the upper right. So, the, okay. so this was part of the really hard work. The blob in the upper right which is circled is Way to go, Scott. Good cue. <laughs> I'm a professional, Tony. You are. I, I'm professional. I'm amazed. That's what we think is uh, what's called the brightest cluster galaxy, which is, as mentioned here, the central cluster galaxy. So it is a huge mass of galaxy, which is sitting at the very center of this galaxy cluster. And it's different than all other galaxies in the universe. So most galaxy clusters have one of these hulking giants sitting in their very centers. And so we think that the tail is kind of emanating out from that object. So if you trace it all the way back, you can see it sort of curls its way back into that object. Just for interest, the two, there's two bright blobs to the lower left. And those are actually, they have nothing to do with the galaxy cluster. We've confirmed using Keck that those are things that are actually seen from the foreground. Oh, so good. So those people, you've got redshift. we got, got redshift. Red shift. Yeah. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Interesting. That's very interesting. Because mm -hmm. it looked like, at first glance, in the line of sight, that they are all really close together. Well, that's what we thought originally. And it was a lot of hard work to show that they weren't. And they're just kind of, they're, they're actually frustrating. They're in our way. Yeah. <laughs> You think, you think nature would be a little more yes. accommodating with some of its some of its <laughs> secrets. Well, okay. So now this was this was something you kind of didn't expect to find, right? That's sort of the uh, impression I get from reading the press release. You guys weren't expecting this. Oh, this isn't common. That's right. So, to my knowledge, this is only the second example of this kind of thing. Um, this kind of thing, meaning this very violent, ripped apart galaxy sitting at the center of a galaxy cluster. Um, that's this large. Um, usually when we look, so I mentioned that every massive galaxy cluster has one of these hulking galaxies at its center and these are not only the most massive galaxies in the universe but some of the oldest and by old we mean they formed their stars a long long time ago and they haven't formed any since. So like elliptical galaxies? Exactly, yeah. they're the biggest yeah. elliptical galaxies in the universe. Now, are these clusters, let me just interrupt you real quick to make sure I'm, a, you said there's usually a hulking mass in the center of these, are they gravitationally bound to it, or is it, is it just loosely, are they loosely connected, what's the connection there? You mean the galaxies with the brightest cluster galaxy? Yes. Well, the whole, so the whole cluster is bound together by its dark matter, essentially, and the brightest cluster galaxy sits at the very center of that dark matter distribution. Okay. So they're all bound together. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so this was something you didn't expect to see as, as well, violently. Well, so as far back as we've looked, um, most, almost all galaxy clusters have these massive galaxy, galaxies in their center, and these massive galaxies look old. So it's a real mystery in astrophysics. One of our big questions is how and when did these things form? Because we figure if we keep looking back in time, deeper and deeper images, we should at some point see these things forming, and that is yet to happen. And so this was one of the first images that actually caught one of these objects in a phase that we think is a phase related to its formation. And that is this violent phase of ripping apart one galaxy to cannibalize it and then forming new stars as it does that. 
Okay. Well, the uh, it, I want to get to this topic or this concept. I'm not quite sure how to make the se the segue, but there was a there's this thing that we that was mentioned, and we've had a we've had a hang on on this before about something called beads on a string, and this is a characteristic of pockets of gas of where new stars are being born inside the cluster. And th is this one of those things? Is that a bead on a string, or is we that... think so? We think okay. so. We think that if you if you look if you look at just the bare bones HSD image without the the Spitzer image overlaid, you can see it a little bit better. But if you look at the central, the really do you have that handy, Scott? I don't think so. I think we've oh. only got the. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. The... I'm talking about really the raw data. I see. Um, I see. Okay. If you look in the center regions where the tail comes out from the central cluster galaxy, you'll notice that along there, there's these sort of equally spaced uh, clumps all the way along before the whole thing kind of blows up. Oh, yeah, yeah, there they are. And that's what we call beads on a string. And it's the same kind of physics, um, really, as beads collecting on a string, and sort of these, these clumps of condensation um, along okay. this line. Okay, now, because I'm a man-child and I'm infantile, this part made me laugh, but uh, the, this is what you're calling a wet merger, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I and, yes. Oh, my God. Can I we know. not invent can we, that term? Can we <laughs> mute him? <laughs> <laughs> but there, this, is, this is simply a state, uh, it, it's what you're describing, when it's gas, uh, which I guess is somehow characterized as wet, being involved in a in a uh, in a star forming region like this, right? Well, that's right. So what we're seeing, so just to be clear, what we're seeing with the HST image is not the gas, but the stars. But we know that there has to be gas there because there's so much star formation going on, and the stars have to be forming out of gas. So the, between the infrared wavelengths, which are generating the heat and the visible light, which we see here in Hubble, there's a lot of other physics going on. There's a lot of other physics. That's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. Which, which we hope that's sort of one of the next things that we'll do is get a real a picture of the actual gas. Okay. So the, when there's lots of gas involved, that's a wet merger. But the 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 dry ones are they are they just uh, they still have gas because they. Uh, they, no. are creating, they are they just don't there's, there's no stars being there's created. so what a dry merger is and and it's been known for a long time well, it's been known that uh, brightest cluster galaxies can grow through what are called dry mergers and a dry merger is when two galaxies merge but they're old elliptical galaxies and neither one of them has very much gas to bring to the table essentially and so there's no fuel there for new star formation. Whereas in a wet merger, uh, at least one of the galaxies is a galaxy more like our own Milky Way with a lot of gas. And that gas is then compressed and funneled and channeled during the merger to form new stars. So in a mer both are kinds of mergers where two galaxies collide together and eventually form one larger galaxy. But in the dry merger, the stars just kind of come together, and in a wet merger, there's new stars being formed. Okay, so and it's the wet mergers that haven't been seen before at the centers of clusters. Okay, so yeah, and this is uh, uh, something that you expected to find, as you say, but haven't yet. And this is one of the first first times you've seen one of these. Um, there, I, I guess. Um, so let me. There's a there's a. a a quick question in here that has been sitting for a while. I want to ask, this is about the galaxy cluster. This is from John Glasgow on the Q&A app. He's going, is the pinwheel galaxy, which is M101, when, and he even knows that it's six par megaparsecs away. Good job, John. Uh, anywhere ne is, it, is the pinwheel anywhere near this cluster, or is this cluster much farther away? Now, the pinwheel galaxy is one of the most uh, detailed images of a spiral galaxy that Hubble's ever taken. Um, but where is it? Do, you, do we know where it might be with relation to M101? Oh, gosh. Do you uh, mean on the sky or in yeah. terms of distance? Well, it's in Ursa Major, I believe. And so, rough, is it anywhere nearby other than just say it's in the same constellation? Or is it not really a part of the cluster? No, no, no. Pinwheel's a nearby, relatively nearby galaxy. Okay. So these are much further away then. Yeah. All right. All right, thank you, John. That was a good question. Um, so um, let's see. The um, so 
are there other galaxy clusters as part of the survey that you're looking at, or are you going to continue looking more closely at this particular one? To is there anything more to, that we can learn from this, both with other, say, wavelengths or or other observations that you might want to make? Yeah. So we're we're well, we're doing both. We're actively trying to study this particular object in more detail. So, like I said, one of the things we would like to do is get an image of the actual gas within this system and see where the gas is and what the gas is doing. And so we have some proposals in to do that as well. And we'd like to learn more about the cluster as a whole. We'd like to confirm more members and get a, ver a better measurement of its mass so we know exactly what we're dealing with. But at the same time, Adam's survey has produced hundreds and hundreds of galaxy clusters at large distances from us. And many of them show evidence that they might be similar systems to this. And in so what, we might, in what way? Be, I, mean, yeah. I just want to get Adam to comment on that a little bit. Yeah. When what, so what are, what are some of these characteristics that you're noticing and other... Are you looking primarily for bright spots and even for red, or what are you... Uh, what are you looking at? Yeah, well, that's that's precisely it, right? We are looking for things that are um, really red overall. So when we did the thing with the Canada France, you want them to be not very bright in the optical, and then in combination to be very bright with Spitzer. So big big lumps of galaxies that are bright in Spitzer and not very bright in uh, in the optical. And we have found, as Tracy said, uh, a few hundred of them. I think what she's referring to is, uh, you know, Tracy is a very prolific uh, scientist, and she also wrote a paper in the last couple of weeks where she looked at some of the other um, brightest cluster galaxies and some of the other clusters we found. And what we're finding is that while this kind of thing that, that we're talking about today um, is very rare, particularly nearby, as we start looking at more and more of these very distant clusters, um, it's still uncommon, but it's not completely uncommon. So there's, there's some other clusters in our survey where the central galaxy has potentially very high star formation rates, just like this one. Cool. Okay, so uh, Andrew Planet's got a good question I want to ask real quick, and that is, if these galaxy clusters contain supermassive black holes in their centers, uh, could star formation be due to the constituents condensing from black hole high-energy jets forming gas fuel for new stars in the process, is that at all possible? So, what are the you know are black holes playing any role in star formation, uh, either feeding it or causing it causing it to condense in these galaxy clusters? So that's a another really good question, and I didn't mention this at all, but we do know that there well we suspect strongly that there is a black hole at the center of this galaxy cluster. And it's also contributing to the infrared emission that uh, we've been mentioning, the intense infrared emission that we see from it. It's not dominating. Most of the energy that's being produced in the infrared is coming from star formation, but there is a black hole there. Whether or not the black hole is causing the star formation is an interesting idea because, in fact, black holes are usually invoked in these situations to do the opposite to actually stop the star formation. So the feedback from, so your listener mentioned these jets that come out of the black hole, the radiative and mechanical feedback that comes from the accretion disk and all the other activity that's going on around a black hole can actually disrupt the star formation and blow the gas out of, you know, keep, keep it from condensing and forming new stars. And so we think that if the black hole in this particular cluster is allowed to grow, it might actually stop the star formation that we're seeing. And that, may be, and that might be why this, these things are so hard to see, period, right? I mean, in, in most galaxy clusters, it could be these black holes are disrupting a lot of the star formation. It's, right? it's a good question. So one of the questions we were trying to get at, at in one of the papers was what was this, essentially the duty cycle? How long does the star formation go on for before an AGN shuts it down? And you can AGN is an active sorry, galactic a, nucleus. an active galactic nucleus, a, a black hole. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that these things appear to be quite rare may be telling us that the AGN, that the black hole shuts it down very rapidly. Okay, good question, Andrew. Thanks as always. And uh, Cecil Morgan's asking, what instrument? This is from the Q and A app. What instruments would be used to see the gas? Um, presumably, the infrared showing you not the gas, but the heat coming from the star formation 
and the Hubble, the, the infrared or the visible light, are showing the stars. What could you use to see the gas with? So for that, we're hoping again to use um, a spectroscopic instrument on the Keck telescope. Essentially, what we need to do is get what's called a spectrum of the galaxy, and that's the same in the region surrounding it. That's the same kind of observation that we do to get a redshift. And there we're looking for emission that's coming from the gas. So we're looking for the hydrogen lines and the oxygen lines, basically using the same kind of physics that people use in, in neon lights to try and, and see the gas in that way. So it would be a ground-based optical and infrared spectrograph. Cool. Yeah, that's that's important. We've all, I don't know if you've ever done that lab experiment where you've looked at a at a tube, uh, like a, a a spectrum tube through a, a little pair of glasses, and you can see the lines coming from it. Uh, it's something very similar. It's the bright lines that uh, would black and the bright and dark absorption lines coming from a spectrum that tell you what elements are in that gas and whether there's gas present. So, good question, Cecil. Okay, I want to point out one little thing that I noticed when I was reading about it. It's a, it was. Um, a good comparison of the star formation rates. Apparently, according to what you guys have found, this is creating, this little uh, region is creating about 860 new stars a year. And by comparison, our Milky Way galaxy uh, generally forms only about one or two stars a year. So this is quite a bit. This is a, a, a huge increase in star forming uh, activity. Yeah, that's right. It's. Uh, I mean, I think maybe Allison can comment on this a little better than I can because she was the one who who made that measurement. I love that idea. Go ahead, Allison. Yeah. Well, so um, basically, the way you can calculate this is by using all of the data that we've been talking about, um, but particularly at the infrared and some millimeter wavelengths, which, as Carol mentioned earlier, um, really is tracing the dust that's being heated by the stars. So once you have a, a, the UV radiation coming from a star, it heats all this dust and it re-radiates in the infrared wavelengths. So when you have um, multiple um, wavelengths from different telescopes, all in the infrared and some millimeter wavelengths, you can get a pretty good estimate of the star formation rates. Um, so that's what we've done with Herschel and the JCMT and Spitzer. So those are the, the primary instruments we use to measure the star formation rate. Right? And yes, it's forming about 860 suns per year. Cool. So, That's Carol, I, I have a question for you, Carol. And I don't know if this may be totally dumb, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And uh, the ultraviolet, which Hubble has got an instrument on that lets us see in that wavelength, could you see anything in the ultraviolet, do you think, uh, in this situation or no? Because it does, doesn't it say well, something about stars? Forming. Yes, well, I mean, they have an observation of it, which I, I don't have, but um, sometimes it depends. It depends on how much dust is in the system. If they've got a lot of dust in front of whatever the UV radiation is, then you're not really, really going to see it. So um, I, haven't, I haven't seen the pure Hubble image, but it, it just depends. Um, if, if you don't have a lot of dust in the system anymore, you could get a lot of UV radiation coming out. So it, it just depends on the circumstance of the object you're trying to look at. Have you thought about that wavelength, Tracy, or is that probably not going to work here? Well, so in fact, the image that you're seeing with Hubble is pretty close to the ultraviolet. Um, it's, it's taken in the infrared wavelengths, but because of the redshift, because of the great distance that this cluster is from us, what we're actually seeing is light that was emitted in the UV. Oh, good point. So these are oh. actually the young stars that we're probably seeing in, okay. in this, this tail. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, all right, I think, uh, Scott, I'm looking around, and, oh, wait, here's one from Andrew Planet. I'm going to ask you in a minute for Twitter, so let me get this question from Andrew again. He goes, thanks for the answer. He's the one that asked the black hole question. Um, <laughs> what eventually happens, then, to all the material that makes up high-energy jets? So I think these jets are assumed to be producing if they're actively, well, if they're active, they're feeding on surrounding material. So uh, do these... First of all, are there jets here? And if so, what what happens to all that stuff? So I'm not an expert on black holes in the centers of galaxy clusters. I don't know if Adam feels 
any more comfortable with that than I do. What about you, Adam? Do you feel like a... <laughs> Hey, at least I'm not asking you to calculate sending things on uh, in, in terms of... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can go on about it, but it's not... <laughs> okay, well, uh, why don't you just say what you were thinking, and then uh, we'll see okay. if that answers this question. Well, I mean, certainly there's... We don't, we don't see any jets uh, in this image yet, but we haven't really looked at the right wavelengths. So it is possible that there might be some jets there. And we have a proposal into the Very Large Array, which is a radio telescope, to see what kind of radio emission is coming from this thing. We're hoping also to get some X-ray observations, possibly from Chandra, to see if there's any signs of bl a black hole activity as well. So the, as to what happens to all the material that's blown out from the jets, I think that's I mean, what happens is it goes out into the what we call the intercluster medium, which is all of the gas and material in between the galaxies within the galaxy cluster. In so we have when we have a galaxy cluster, it, there's a whole bunch of galaxies that you can see. There's a whole bunch of dark matter holding it together, and then there's also a lot of hot gas. And so the material that's being blown out from the center of the galaxy cluster will be form will form part of this intercluster medium. But we, I have collaborators who, who study this um, a lot here in Montreal, and you know, they, can, they see all sorts of wonderful images in the X-ray of huge holes and cavities being blown out within the intercluster medium that they think are being caused by these jets just basically clearing away material. Um, so it's a very violent place, and how it all settles down, I think, is, is an open question. Yeah, that's a good question, and it, 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 it highlights the uh, importance of all the wavelengths you can get to bear on a on a particular area of the sky is always useful, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so Scott, do you see anything on Twitter? Is there anything I should we should we should yeah, mention we, on that? It's a question that we've touched on and we've kind of danced around, but uh, I'm really sorry. There's no I, dancing on these hangouts. I really... um, yes, there's dancing. You just don't know it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name, but Noor Trabelsi, she's wondering how we're able to measure the redshift. So we've we've talked about spectra, but how were you able to, uh, and this was back before we were talking about how the, the two blobs in the lower left were actually foreground objects, and she was wondering how you were able to find out, you, you know, how you're you able to measure the redshift to find out that it is a foreground object. Adam, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Um, it's 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 once you get the data, it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. What we're what we're looking for is um, Tracy mentioned before these emission lines that you see um, come from gas and come from star or absorption lines come from stars in the galaxy. And so when we get a spectrum, we see a series of absorption features and a series of of emission features. And what we do is we know what wavelength we would see them at if they were here on Earth. And of course, because they're not here on Earth and they're very far away and they're red shifted and they're moving away from us, the wavelength that we see them as has been shifted into the red. And so we simply compare all those wavelengths that we know, you know, all those features that, that we know, the wavelengths that we measure to the ones we know they should be, and that difference is the red shift. And, and from the red shift, um, based on knowing stuff about the way the universe expands, we can tell how far away it is. Right, and uh, uh, another interesting part about this whole thing is the the uh, the fact that the wavelengths, what what uh, Tracy was talking about earlier, the fact that these stars were burning bright in one wavelength as the as the uh, as the, the universe expanded and they and they got further away, they uh, they shifted the wavelengths of those light into the lower wavelengths of infrared, which I think is it's always kind of blows my mind a little bit. And um, so and so when you have the two what Tracy very early on said is a two dimensional image so you have this two dimensional image which gives you like x and y to get the z then you look at these red shifts and right. depending on how close the cluster is sometimes you can get enough resolution not only to tell that all those objects have the same red shift and some it, another object is in front because it's not as far away sometimes you can actually tell the individual motions within there so you know how far away and then they have a little bit of little bitty motions relative to like the central this big massive central thing so it just depends on how far away it is, how much light it puts out, the resolution of the spectrograph, all those 
combinations, but certainly telling a foreground object from the cluster object is, is fairly straightforward. Yeah, I can add, that's actually what we do. We do see those extra little wiggles on top of it, and those extra little wiggles are the galaxies moving around inside the cluster, and for measuring that, that's actually how, how we figured out how much mass is in the cluster, and that's how we know this is, you know, 100 trillion suns worth of, worth of mass uh, in the center of this cluster. Okay. Uh, Adam Synergy, I see you there. You're in... A long time viewer, he's on the uh, the Google Plus event page. He's uh, he's saying that he's having trouble watching on Mrs. Synergy's iPad today. Is that your real name, Synergy? That's really cool. The Q and A app doesn't want to play nicely, so you folks have a day off from my crazy questions. <laughs> he, so you guys got a reprieve, Adam. I, uh, generally, I did tell him he can get us on Twitter, but I've not seen him on Twitter yet. <laughs> Synergy. I would. I want that last name. Okay. Um, Okay, well, Scott. Anything else? Am I missing anything? Are we? Did you get it all? No, I, I, that's you know, anything's been already asked uh, or answered in the in the hangout. It's been really great as far as our interaction on there. Let me check uh, YouTube real quick to make sure we haven't missed anything over there. Yeah, I keep forgetting to do that. Are you kidding? We solved all the mysteries of the universe in <laughs> less than an hour. No. <laughs> in less than an hour. That's we right. Get, we should get a bonus. We should. No, we should get wine served to us. <laughs> yeah. Well, we know that. I know, we know I that know. the Italian yeah. contingent. Some the Italian, people may be already getting there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the really Italian wild. contingent, yeah. they're they're getting ready. I'm sure. Oh, we won't no. mention who those people. Well, we didn't even do a, we didn't, we didn't get our word for the drinking game this time around either. But maybe next week. Okay. Well, folks, I guess we're gonna we're gonna call it there. Uh, Tracy, uh, 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 Tracy Webb, and uh, Allison, and and Adam. I want to thank all of you for joining us today and sharing with us your research on uh, on this galaxy cluster. And hopefully, when you get more wavelengths, you'll come back and uh, and, sh and show us what you found or give us an update on what's happening. Well, can we get, will you do that for us? For sure. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, guys. I guess that's it. On behalf of Scott Lewis, Carol Christian, I want to thank you all for watching. We will be back next week, same Hubble time, same Hubble channel, and come up with a new Hubble name. All right, Hubble Holics. That was mine. I came up with that one this week. So I'm still, Hubble. I'm still dealing with Hubblers. I know. Hubble. I'm, I'm still, and I'm still a Hubble hugger. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's right. Hubble hug, Hubble Holics has too many negative Hubble colors. Hubblers is new. Yeah, right. Yeah, Hublandos, Hublandos. Okay. Hublandos. Okay. <laughs> all right, folks. I think the word was actually squishy. Squish? Oh, yeah. was that our? Well, we didn't. Did nobody. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't. We didn't. Know it. Tony, you can be my squishy Hubble hugger. Oh, no. yeah, that's just <laughs> gross. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay, folks. I think we're done. Thanks to thanks to all of you for watching. We'll see you guys next week, and as always, keep, keep looking up. up.